morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar uh, presentation on infection prevention and control programs and the role of IPAC leads in long-term care. My name is Boris Marufov, and I'm a team lead at IPAC PHO, and I have uh, the pleasure of moderating today's session. Um, so to give you a little background about these coming series is that Public Health on is hosting a six part weekly webinar series to provide orientation information to IPAC leads in the long term care homes, as it defined in uh, fixing the long term care home act. This session, this first presentation will address the key topics of IPAC uh, for IPAC leads need to know to build a strong IPAC program in their long term care homes. Before we begin with today's session, I mentioned a few um, housekeeping items. The first is the chat pod uh, has been disabled to limit the distractions during the presentation. Please use a Q&A pod on the bottom of your screen if you have any questions during the session. A discussion and the question period will be at the end, will follow the presentation. And presentation slides and the recording Will be made available in two weeks from now um, at our website and if you have any uh, questions any uh, point during the session or experience any technical issues please uh, email uh, capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca uh, with that uh, let me uh, introduce uh, today's speakers they are um, laurie shatler and sarah eden Lori Schatzler is an uh, infection prevention control specialist with Public Health Ontario. Prior to Public Health Ontario, Lori worked at, as an occupational health nurse in acute care, a primary care nurse with the family health team, and the public health nurse with several public health units in North, Northeastern Ontario and Michigan. Lori has maintained her certification in infection prevention control and epidemiology, CIC and uh, occupational health nursing brings uh, these areas of expertise to her current role uh, with PHO. Sarah Eden received her uh, bachelor's degree from Laurentian University and uh, completed additional courses in biology and infection control. She had obtained her CIC designation and has been recertified from the Certification Board of Infection Prevention Control and Epidemiology since then. She has worked as a research assistant infection control practitioner at the large academic acute care hospital. Sarah joined the regional infection uh, control networks in 2008 and has since worked as a network coordinator, acting regional um, infection uh, control network manager, and now as a regional infection prevention control specialist at Public Health Ontario. So I will ask now uh, Lori to begin the presentation. Welcome everybody. I want to um, thank you all for joining us in this very busy time. We're still in COVID-19 pandemic and I appreciate all of you coming online to, to join us today. We do have some IPAC hub partners on the line as well and welcome everybody. We hope in the next hour that we'll be able to highlight Things you need to know in developing your IPAC program, including understanding applicable regulation standards, guidelines, and best practices. We're going to cover some key components that are integral to your IPAC program, including your IPAC committee. We're going to talk a little bit about how to evaluate your IPAC program and look for areas of improvement. And again, focusing on ongoing training to support those activities and talk about your role and how you're a leader and influencer in your organization. We'll have five minutes to go over a new PHO product, which is a checklist to help guide you as a roadmap through your IPAC orientation. Now that you've been an IPAC lead in your, in your home, we'll take some time to go over IPAC programs, which I'll cover, and then Sarah will cover the role of the IPAC lead, and we'll have some time for Q&A. So I'm really excited about this document that PHO has developed. We're going to be launching this on a new web page just for you that will contain this checklist and the recorded webinar series that we are the first of. And we hope that these resources will help support build your IPAC knowledge. Uh, the 
the checklist is nice that it's um, divided up in sections and you can use it uh, to look at how you want to outline your progress through your professional development and your orientation. It goes through key sections of your IPAC program components and then how to network. All right, so let's talk about uh, building an IPAC program. And as boys mentioned, this is a first session in the beginning of series. So we're gonna focus on the program and your profession. Let's talk about why, have, why should you have an IPAC program? And this is a question you might get asked by senior leadership. You may be part of senior leadership and you have to advocate for it. And ideally the goal is really anyone under your roof you want to be able to reduce those persons being exposed to infections and acquiring healthcare associated infections. So whether those are residents or healthcare workers in your facility, other people coming into your facility, you don't want them leaving with something they didn't come in with. Certainly you don't want them bringing something in that would expose the people within your facility. Ideally, we wanna reduce those healthcare associated infections and reduce the severe outcomes associated with those infections. And we certainly saw this with COVID-19 pandemic in long-term care and how residents were disproportionately affected by those severe outcomes. Ideally also, uh, we want to improve a, a safety culture within your organization. And this can't be done alone. It needs to be done collaboratively as a group at a uh, organizational wide program and it's going to be done in terms of uh, having supportive senior leadership. How do you do that? Well, we do have the Fixing Long-Term Care Homes Act and other legislative requirements, and these are must-dos. These are acts and associated regulations that need to be met within your organization, and it's not a nice to know or a nice to do, it is a must-do. That is one example. The other example that all of you know is the Ontario Occupational Health and Safety Act and regulations. So regulations uh, have a lot of clout. Um, there are inspectors attached to certain ministries such as Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Long-Term Care to support ensuring that compliance is being met. We know with COVID, there were certain directives that came out for different disciplines, including long-term care based on the Long-Term Care Home Act, for example, where additional IPAC measures were uh, required for homes to implement. These uh, directives are things that can change over time and certainly be removed. The standards, on the other hand, are not legislated, but they are deemed prudent. So what that means is it is a standard of care that's expected in the industry that you're in. Canadian Standards Association is one example of that. We know with COVID-19, uh, at a certain point in the pandemic, uh, N95, respirators were required for certain activities with COVID-19. And part of that is to have a respiratory protection program. CSA standards has a standard for that on what's required. So that's one example. In terms of guidelines, these are evidence-based statements of practice and they're really there to support you uh, in how to guide your practice. They are updated regularly. We've given you example of one you might be familiar with. It's through uh, the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, which was a November 2018 document. We know if that gets updated. We have two different ministries now, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Long-Term Care. But this document was to support homes, also to support public health units to um, uh, work through outbreaks within long-term care. As far as best practices, they are evidence-based, and when there isn't evidence, then it's an expert panel that's brought together to provide recommendations where evidence is lacking. They are based on a plethora of research to put them together and very practical, meaning that they're, they go into quite a bit of detail on specific aspects of IPAC. One example here is a suite of best practice documents that Public Health Ontario has on our website that's successful for you that are through the Provincial Infectious Disease Advisory Committee through Public Health Ontario. 
So we're going to talk about the key components of an IPAC program. We've highlighted uh, a chunk of them here. We feel that these are aspects of an IPAC program that uh, most programs have that are common. Uh, you see them laid out here, and we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about them. We highlight the IPAC committee specifically as a part of your program. This solidifies your program. It keeps it sustainable as members come and go. You're not alone doing this job. The role of the committee is to really verify uh, that the infection prevention and control recommendations and standards are being followed. So all of those, the legislation, the mandates, the uh, everything that I just spoke of, that it's implemented within your organization and that it's current. And your committee can set annual goals, you can evaluate your program, and you can really sure that everything's being met. And you can choose uh, who you have on your committee. And if you're a small organization that doesn't have uh, an IPAC committee, you may wanna think of developing one or maybe look at another committee as representation across your, your workplace. To, to have a standing agenda item for IPAC. In terms of policies and procedures, again, you want these to be consistent with all of the legislation and standards that we spoke of. And they're gonna look different um, based on the home and your home's needs. And so we, we don't recommend just using a cookie cutter approach and maybe boring a policy, although it's we often um, hear this, that people want to borrow policies or maybe purchase policies, but you want to ensure that you're meeting standards, you're meeting legislative requirements, and that it's based on what you need in your facility for the activities you're doing. You want to ensure that your policies are reviewed and updated as required. We know COVID-19 certainly put this a spin on this to ensure you had what you needed to have in place and that you needed to review that regularly and also that your policies can be linked to your education programs and that you wanna implement action plans as well and have those developed. So how do you evaluate your IPAC program? There's a couple of approaches. One is an organizational risk assessment and the other is auditing your IPAC practices. And with an organizational risk assessment, this is really looking at what are the risks of, um, infection within your facility. So from an IPAC perspective at an organizational level, what are those risks? How to identify them? And how can you mitigate that and put control measures in place? And you ideally want to review this as a baseline annually. And anytime any significant changes occur, you can um, use this risk assessment to develop your program goals. So you, maybe you highlight one key area you wanna focus on right now, and you want to look at factors that are gonna influence that, such as your resident population, some of the services you provide and ensuring you're compliant with standards. You can certainly do this in consultation with your IPAC committee. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. You can do one or a handful of uh, factors that you wanna focus on in terms of your goals on a yearly basis. One example here, maybe with the COVID-19 pandemic, you noticed maybe in uh, collaboration with your IPAC hub coming in to help support you, that PPE training wasn't being done consistently. Maybe there were some staff that weren't PPE correctly. One small uh, program component might be to ensure that your PPE policy is implemented and that procedures are clearly outlined for expectations for education and training. It's one small aspect when we highlight a program component and how a policy and procedure is part of that. It helps support the work you're trying to um, support within your teams. In terms of auditing, and IPAC practice audits. This is really to look at um, what you're doing currently. You want to identify gaps. You want to be able to look at that to um, put implementation measures in place. And then you want to be able to audit regularly to see, uh, see if there are improvements. And these are just some examples here. 
for um, environmental cleaning practices, hand hygiene, compliance, and PPE use. So audits need to be performed by trained observers. Uh, observers should be a train, um, familiar with best practices. You want them to be a leader in your organization, someone that's uh, reputable or at least well-respected by staff, and that audits need to be done in a non-threatening manner as a way of improving your program, so not directed at the person. We recommend regular intervals, one so that you give enough time if you're implementing a measure that you can see results uh, frequently enough so that you're picking up any lapses uh, early on so you can make changes. And um, that you also want to audit in terms of uh, if there's any changes to practice or process, or maybe you're noticing changes in rates of healthcare associated infections, which is part of a surveillance program that we'll be talking about on webinar two. So your results certainly can be developed um, and targeted, uh, appropriate for what you find with your auditing. You want to ensure with auditing that you've conducted enough of them so you get a good result and that you're making changes that are meaningful in your organization. Excited about this other resource for you, Public Health Ontario has put together a suite of auditing tools for personal protective equipment. We have uh, four listed here and they are linked on our website in a separate section under IPAC for PPE auditing. We have an at-a-glance document on implementing PPE audits in your facility. We have a recorded webinar that you can review to support that implementation. And we have two audit forms. One is to support the use of PPE and one is for auditing PPE use. Um, the nice thing about this last form uh, as an example is that you can uh, use it electronically, complete the data and it will auto-populate your results for you in real time. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Sarah and talk about the role of the IPAC lead. Thanks very much, Lori. So that's great. Uh, Lori's given you a bit of an overview about things to think about at the program or organization level for your IPAC program. And I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the role of the IPAC lead. So next slide. So to be an IPAC uh, lead in long-term care, uh, many uh, new leads might be asking, how do I develop knowledge and skills? Uh, the, first, the first bullet on this slide is looking at education and training. Uh, one comment about that is the IPAC lead does need dedicated time and resources to put towards education and training. Uh, sort of the roadmap and the process of uh, orientation uh, that was discussed uh, earlier can be used, uh, that checklist can be used as a helpful resource to guide you along your way. Uh, there will be a learning curve if you are brand new or novice in the role as far as uh, your professional development. So at a minimum, your IPAC leads should probably make sure that they have completed and understand the IPAC core competencies. Uh, and then things like this education series uh, that are being developed uh, and we're going to be offering in a modular way. Today, we'll give you a bit of an overview of many of the areas where you might want to look to focusing uh, knowledge and skills. And subsequent uh, sessions will go into more detail about these topics to help you kind of map out what are your education and training needs. Um, a couple of the Public Health Ontario resources are listed there. Uh, and you will see under the courses bullet, it is encouraging you to check IPAC Canada. So IPAC Canada is our National Professional Association for Infection Prevention and Control for a list of endorsed courses. Um, in addition to formal education, you might want to think about incorporating some of that informal learning in your training and education. So that may include things like communities of practice, working with your hubs, getting involved or becoming a member of your local IPAC Canada chapter, and some of that networking and other things to complement the formal or courses that you might be interested in learning for your knowledge and skill development. 
uh, many people might be thinking about uh, certification in infection prevention and control right now. I know that's a question we are uh, getting asked about from time to time. And uh, in time, New Leaves, you may decide that uh, CIC or certification in infection prevention control is right for you. And there are two different uh, exams available to write through the Certification Board of Infection Control and Epidemiology. So that is that CBIC uh, link that you do see on your slide. Uh, the CIC or Certification in Infection Prevention Control, it is intended to provide an objective measurement really of meeting standards and current knowledge uh, and it's recognized and respected within infection control as well as without, uh, outside of infection control really as a, a level of uh, knowledge and skill. In order to uh, be eligible to write the CIC exam, there are eligibility requirements. So that would be uh, two years of practice in infection control as well as educational uh, requirements. And when people have obtained that CIC certification, they are required to recertify every five years uh, just to maintain that certification. Uh, there is also an AIPC, so you see the two credentials at the last bullet point, the CIC, that Certification and Infection Control I just mentioned, but there is also an Associate in Infection Prevention and Control, and this is an entry-level certification exam. It's a measure of uh, basic infection prevention control competency. It's intended for a novice ICP, uh, those who might be just starting out or interested in pursuing a career in infection prevention control who might not yet meet eligibility for uh, CIC exams. So if you're interested in more information about certification, do look to the uh, CBIC website. Okay, and what are my activities? So what is involved in being an IPAC lead? So for people who are uh, very new or novice, you may be just starting to get a bit of a scope that's probably been quite influenced by a COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, over the last little while. Uh, the role of the IPAC lead can be more broad um, than that. And this slide will give you an idea of some of the areas uh, that you would be uh, responsible for supporting the implementation of IPAC best practices. So that will include environmental cleaning, reprocessing, surveillance, education, occupational health, construction, renovation, maintenance, design, and program administration and evaluation. So there's a lot of areas right now. And uh, you'll note that I did say really supporting the implementation of IPAC. So it doesn't mean you will be responsible or doing all of these things alone, but there really is an integral role for uh, the IPAC lead in all of these areas. And uh, in the next uh, couple of slides, I'm just going to go through each of these a uh, little bit of an overview. And uh, please know that in subsequent sessions, we will be doing a more detailed look at these topics. So when we're thinking about environmental uh, cleaning, it's important to really recognize that uh, the environment does play a role in transmission of potentially infectious agents in the long-term care environment. And environmental cleaning is an area where there is shared responsibility between IPAC and the environmental cleaning or environmental service uh, department. Uh, it's really important to foster some strong relationships and work together with environmental uh, service. So to see where you can assist, provide some expert guidance and uh, collaborate. Uh, so understanding key principles of cleaning and disinfection is part of the role of the IPAC lead. So understanding some of those principles may be helpful if you're supporting your environmental service with selection of an appropriate use of cleaning or disinfecting products. Uh, maybe you're contributing to uh, policies around waste management, laundry linen handling, or uh, safe management of uh, sharps, environmental service staff could be at risk for uh, sharp related injuries. So there are a lot of areas where you may be uh, collaborating together and really uh, work to understand the role of the environment and the risks 
and how you can work together with environmental cleaning to reduce those risks. Then if we move on to reprocessing, um, reprocessing is an area where the IPAC lead does need to have an understanding and awareness of best practices in reprocessing. Uh, so reprocessing is an important activity that may be happening in your home if you're uh, doing any sort of reuse of shared medical equipment or devices. And the IPAC lead does need to have a good understanding of best practices in the areas of reprocessing, as well as the activities that are happening within your home. So what equipment and devices are being shared? Uh, how are they being reprocessed in the home? What is a single use uh, piece of equipment and ensuring that that is being used as a single use device also? Uh, in later sessions, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Spalding's classification system. So this is a classification system for uh, medical devices. We will look at that in a little bit more detail, but it's really how equipment and devices are categorized based on use and risk of uh, transmission of infection, infectious agents, and that will identify the level of reprocessing that is required. Um, so different uh, types of equipment may have different reprocessing requirements and that we will do in a little bit more detail. The all over goal is to make sure anything that is reused, whether it is uh, equipment that you have in your home or if it is any kind of medical equipment or devices that are being brought in by uh, an external care provider, uh, maybe foot care equipment or other things are uh, safe for reuse. So we will talk a little bit more about how do you make the determination? What is reprocessing and the different levels and standards? And the last piece for the role of the IPAC is really familiarity with quality control measures to ensure that uh, safe and effective reprocessing uh, is in place. So that could be policies and procedures, it could be record keeping and auditing, but really ensuring that you do have a, a safe system and those that are receiving care are not at risk uh, of acquiring any infections because of the way your equipment uh, was reprocessed. It needs to be just as safe for each use for things that are reused. So that's sort of the little overview around a scope of knowledge you will uh, develop or uh, require uh, in the area of reprocessing. So next we have surveillance. Uh, that will be another uh, topic that we will also go into more detail, but within the role of the ICP, surveillance is one of the key activities that uh, will be uh, within your responsibility. So there can be a lot of things around sort of designing a surveillance plan and program based on your uh, population and uh, maybe building on some previous uh, data, as well as making sure that you are using uh, standardized definitions and methods so you have good quality information to help guide your program. Uh, so for surveillance, uh, part of that will be planning and designing the system you will be using. And then there are specific methods for collecting and analyzing uh, surveillance data. Uh, so there are methods that will require some statistical techniques so you can accurately describe data you have collected uh, and you will be able to compare. Uh, most of the time, people will look at comparing surveillance data to previous surveillance data from their own settings, but you may look at uh, other types of uh, uses for your surveillance data. Um, so collecting and analyzing that data Interpreting and presenting the data is also really important. So these are not just uh, numbers or data that you have to save somewhere, but what do they mean for your facility? What does it mean for your program? Uh, there may be changes in your population. There may be small indicators that you are seeing changes in infection rates of different types of infection. So you do need to know how to critically evaluate some of that data and interpret it 
as well as uh, presenting your data surveillance uh, to users. So that could be senior leadership, it could be your frontline staff, it could be a variety of users, but the goal of this surveillance program is really not merely in having data or metrics, but really using that information to feed into your quality improvement and try to improve your IPAC program uh, so that you are reducing risk, aware of what's going on, and can maybe identify some gaps or areas for improvement to you know, uh, add to your infection prevention and control program. So surveillance will be an important piece of uh, that sort of knowledge and skill that uh, you need to be able to uh, measure what's happening uh, with respect to infection prevention and control in your facility. Education. So uh, the IPAC lead role will uh, likely involve a variety of different types of educational activities. Uh, so this could be education for your healthcare workers, healthcare workers with multidisciplinary background. It could be education for families, residents, in some cases, uh, general uh, public. Uh, so education can be an important component of your IPAC program. Uh, and you will want to develop that as a program. So really thinking about the objectives and strategies. So what are the needs for education in your home, as well as the approaches to deliver education that will be most effective to um, the learners and actually help impact their practice. So sometimes uh, delivering an in-service or an education session uh, alone may or may not be sufficient. So education isn't always just magic by itself. You really want to think about, is the information uh, being received in the way people can understand what does that mean for my role, for my day-to-day -day activities, and also think about uh, gaps you're seeing from your uh, surveillance or auditing to really target your education to key areas where it can have the most impact. You'll want to think about uh, adult teaching and learning principles and considering your learners' experiences. So there is a fair bit that can be done through uh, education. It's a really important role. It may alone not be sufficient for uh, practice change. You may need to tailor some of your education, combine it with audits and better understand the issues in your facility. Um, but utilizing those uh, learning principles that is appropriate for your target audience. And this may mean taking different approaches for different types of healthcare workers, for your families, uh, resident council members, residents who are living in your facility. And you may also want to collaborate with others to help deliver the most effective programs and tools. So there will likely be a wide variety of different types of education you will incorporate into your all over education program as an IPAC lead. So the next topic that may or may not be part of your role as an IPAC lead directly, but uh, will definitely be involved uh, in some way will be occupational health. So in some organizations, the IPAC lead may be asked to fill a role with respect to occupational health services, or you might be involved in uh, contributing or collaborating. Uh, if you do have separate occupational health services, very often you will partner with infection prevention and control. So many of you may have experienced this uh, during uh, COVID-19 outbreaks where you need to consider both uh, staff as well as resident cases in the department often uh, needs to work together if they are separate. In many uh, facilities, it may also be under the responsibility of the IPAC lead to have certain levels of uh, occupational uh, health uh, responsibilities within the scope of their work. Um, but there are many opportunities for a collaboration and there are many uh, roles and responsibilities where occupational health and infection prevention and control uh, may intersect. So an example of that could be assistance in the development of an immunization uh, program. Uh, 
So there could also be infection prevention control leads who are involved in the development or review of occupational health and safety procedures. Um, and you might be providing consultation in certain situations. So that could be uh, post-exposure protocols that might be related to a reportable disease or um, uh, a significant organism uh, in your uh, facility or during an outbreak. And you may also be working with staff who may have uh, some fear or need some extra support related to understanding um, risks and prevention approaches for their own personal health and safety in your facility. The next uh, category here that uh, is within the role of the IPAC lead in long-term care relates to construction, renovation, maintenance, and design. And some of you might be wondering, what does construction, <laughs> renovation, maintenance, and design have to do with infection prevention and control? Uh, so this uh, area, uh, CRMD, uh, is really, uh, important relationship with infection prevention and control. Uh, and that might be new to some uh, IPAC leads that they would have an involvement there. And uh, when we're referring to uh, CRMD, it's not necessarily only large major projects like building a new facility or adding a wing or a different unit onto an existing uh, long-term care facility, but it can really involve all levels of uh, activity that could be things like uh, the heating, uh, ventilation, air conditioning. Uh, it could be things like uh, painting, reconfiguring a room or installing portable air conditioning units, uh, a repair that requires uh, moving a ceiling tile. Uh, so a lot of uh, projects really uh, actually can pose a risk of potential infection to residents. So ensuring that construction, renovation, maintenance and design is done uh, safely does involve infection prevention and control. And the IPAC uh, involvement is not just when the work might be happening. Uh, so these uh, CRMD activities typically would uh, work in three different phases. So there's a planning phase, uh, there is a work phase, and lastly, a commissioning phase. And IPAC has a role in each of these phases of work. So you're sort of a key stakeholder and an important member that would be providing input and consultation in all three of these areas of a project. And that's really to help ensure that uh, the planning and the work is done in a thoughtful way that reduces risk of infection. You have a design that will support your IPAC goals. And before the space is ready to be reoccupied or the recommissioning, it is safe for residents to uh, live there and you are reducing the risk of infection with that safe execution of work in all phases. So it is something we will talk about in more detail, but uh, sometimes this is an area where people didn't realize that uh, there was a role for IPAC, and it is a role throughout the different phases of work that's really important for uh, preventing infections. Again, this is the role of the environment or the facility with the health outcomes for the people who live, work, and carry out activities within the home. So there is uh, an IPAC lead role in construction, renovation, maintenance, and design. The next area is a program administration and evaluation. And depending on uh, your uh, concept of your role as an IPAC lead, uh, you may or may not think that this falls within your uh, responsibility, uh, but uh, the IPAC lead needs to be systematically involved in program administration and evaluation in key areas uh, really to ensure that their IPAC program is as effective as possible. 
So it could be uh, developing, reviewing, or providing input on current goals and objectives, and being involved in decisions that determine the resources needed to uh, help accomplish the goals and objectives. Um, so you really do want to be involved in some of the decisions around how your IPAC program is being uh, designed, administrated, and evaluated. So that will be part of the role, as well as uh, communicating those needs to administration and uh, others to ensure that you're able to accomplish the goals and objectives that are set out. Then we get on to the role of the IPAC lead, influencing and leading uh, IPAC within your facility. So the IPAC lead, uh, if we go on to the next slide, the IPAC lead is a leader and an influencer. So you really are a key figure uh, within your organization. Uh, so you can provide direction and work collaboratively with others. It can be sharing knowledge and expertise, as well as influencing uh, organizational policy makers. Uh, so as the IPAC lead, you are looked upon by your organization as a leader. So part of the professional standards uh, for IPAC does require that you're serving as a leader, a mentor, a role model uh, to your IPAC program. Um, so this is an area where you can uh, have a lot of impact and it uh, can also allow you to seek opportunities to influence at the policy creation level, making sure people are able to achieve uh, the best practices um, in a variety of ways, whether it's role modeling, coaching, providing uh, feedback that is helpful for people to integrate those practices into their day-to-day -day activities. And it may require you to be innovative and uh, collaborative in your organization as well. So a little bit more about the IPAC, a leader and influencer, uh, may come under the role of fiscal responsibility. Uh, so with the IPAC lead, um, three primary goals for your IPAC program are to protect the residents, protect healthcare workers, visitors, and others in the environment, and then thirdly, to accomplish those goals in an efficient, effective manner, and whenever possible, also a cost-effective manner. Uh, so IPAC leads will be involved in decisions related to uh, fiscal responsibility and accountability. Um, so that might be providing input about uh, you know, safety and critical outcomes uh, when it comes to program requirements or equipment needs. And it may be incorporating fiscal assessments into your program evaluation and reports. Uh, so you may be involved in maintaining a program budget uh, if it is within the scope of your work. But even if you are not, it is uh, very likely uh, that there will be times when your input is required relative to decisions that may involve uh, cost or fiscal responsibility. And you may be asked to justify the costs of uh, some of the elements of your infection prevention and control program. I think uh, one tip to remember in this area is prevention is a lot more cost effective than control. So we really want to do uh, what we can to prevent as far as best outcomes for residents and those within your long-term care. And also fiscally, it is uh, much better to prevent something than to have to try to control it later on. So staying current in your field uh, will also be part of your role as an IPAC lead. And uh, so that's really integrating some of the current regulatory environments, accreditation, uh, standards and guidelines into your practice and uh, policies and procedures. Uh, we've all seen that sometimes that can change. During the last couple of years, many of those elements have changed fairly frequently during the pandemic. So you may have some experience uh, in uh, sort of working uh, quickly to integrate uh, changing guidance whenever possible. But uh, staying current is going to be uh, very important uh, as an IPAC lead sort of throughout uh, your career. There will be some lifelong learning involved. Uh, and 
in addition to uh, some of those things, really uh, developing some uh, soft skills and communication skills. We do a lot of our work with other people. I've mentioned the role of educator and influencer. So it will be particularly important uh, to be an effective communicator in some uh, difficult situations or to have empathy and support for residents, families, and to be able to communicate with your administrators and others uh, who will be involved in your IPAC program. Uh, and there will also be collaborating and networking with your peers. And that is a real big part of staying current in your field. So it may be things like participating in communities of practice, uh, working with your IPAC hubs, joining your IPAC chapter, or uh, that would be IPAC Canada chapter, or even just finding a uh, buddy, mentor, or someone you feel comfortable uh, calling to share your IPAC issues or bounce ideas uh, off of. Um, so staying current in your field is important and will be ongoing in your role as an IPAC lead uh, because you're going to be the go-to person for IPAC issues in your organization. And on the next slide, I have some additional resources uh, that we've included here. And, uh, you know, there will be a pathway to developing your knowledge and skills. So you won't be developing it all at once when you first start in the role. Uh, but I think it's important to know there are resources out there to help and support you. And uh, some of them are listed with links here on this slide. Um, so there will be more learning that will be uh, ongoing. And at this time, I think I will uh, hand it over to Boyce, who's going to be moderating any questions and answers you may have uh, for us this morning. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah and Lori. It's been uh, a great. And uh, yeah, I see some uh, questions coming up and uh, we, are, we were answering uh, some of them. And please continue to uh, post your um, your questions in the Q&A and also I want to remind everyone um, that the, the session, this recording and also a presentation will be posted in our website, the dedicated website as we mentioned earlier in about a couple of weeks from now. Um, so now I will go through uh, and I will try to group those questions about the same subject uh, probably, but before even going to some of the, the questions, I want to say that this uh, session and, and coming uh, sessions are all orientation for IPAC leads or potential IPAC leads, maybe some of you not in the role yet. Um, and some of the questions related to the regulation and the bylaws like fixing long-term care home act, we will not be able to, to answer you. Uh, it, we are, our role is just to guide you, to direct you and then to provide you know, direction uh, to some, some resources and some of the, the answers, uh, the, it, it's not, uh, you know, up, up to us into those questions related to those regulations. So having said that, I will go with uh, uh, some, some questions, uh, starting with the, um, the audits. What are the, the, the sample sizes for uh, audits? Probably it was around the PPE audit uh, it was mentioned earlier. Uh, that's a great question, and we'll probably go into a li little bit more detail when we focus on specific sections of our IPAC program, like, uh, and, and it's going to depend on the size of the facility. So you want to have a good enough sample size over a long enough period of time, um, and uh, frequently enough over the course of a year to be able to pick that up. I don't know, Sarah, if you have anything else to add. Yeah, I think that's a really uh, great question. And when you're thinking about uh, program auditing and actually practice auditing, things like hand hygiene or PPE use, I think there's a few things to be mindful of. Uh, the larger the sample size you do have, the more likely it is the data will be representative of what's regularly occurring in your facility. 
Uh, as well, um, thinking about not just sample size, but also when and how you're doing your auditing. So to ensure you do have uh, trained observers and you are auditing or measuring things the same way will be important. And within many long-term care environments, the activities can be different at different points of the day, different shifts, uh, maybe nights and weekends. Practices do look quite a bit different. So thinking about a large sample size is great, but also thinking about having some of those audits that are capturing uh, different uh, either areas where care is provided, different times of day will be important. And I think that is uh, really important if you're trying to have the best quality data to inform uh, your overall quality uh, improvement activities. Uh, having said that, even an individual uh, auditing session uh, can provide teachable moments to your frontline staff if they have done something incorrectly or some reassurance that you did that great. You're really understanding the way and the order you should be doffing. Uh, you know, you've cleaned your hands appropriately. So it can offer a lot of value at the individual level for that healthcare provider as well. But when you're thinking about uh, sample sizes, typically, you are thinking larger is uh, better and some programs uh, will have some sample size calculation like for hand hygiene so different sizes of facility and different levels of activity that are occurring in a facility will impact the sort of minimum sample size uh, for your data okay thank you and there are some questions around the requirements for a cic for certification like if uh, RNs and RPNs, uh, um, the eligibility uh, around that, if um, you can uh, quickly highlight on, on, on those, maybe refer to the website as well. Yeah, that's what I was actually going to say is uh, the IPAC lead is a professional role within your organization. And uh, when it comes to requirements for uh, CIC or the AIPC uh, or requirements to meet uh, legislative standards, I would say you need to uh, refer to those standards or also the CBIC website uh, because they do have different uh, eligibility uh, for uh, both uh, sort of professional background education levels, as well as experience in IPAC. So I think ensuring that you do have a uh, lead who can build up their knowledge and skills and look to those external, whether it is, uh, you know, a ministry for legislative standards, or if it is CBIC for eligibility to write, uh, that would be sort of my advice there. Yes, um, thank you. And um, let me see. Um, there are questions, as I mentioned earlier, about the roles and, and responsibilities and the requirements for education uh, according to the Long Term Care Home Act. Um, I, I know that uh, Minister of Long Term Care already did one webinar and doing planning some some more. So. I would suggest uh, uh, attend those uh, um, webinars run by Minister of uh, Long-Term Care, and they will be able to answer questions about all the requirements of education and that um, the uh, the certification requirement within three years and then moving forward. So all those are um, questions to uh, related to Long-Term Care Home Act. So please refer to the the ministry and. Uh, attend the, the webinars to be able to ask uh, questions. Uh, about hours, uh, how many hours per week should spend the IPAC program on uh, and, and practices? It, it's also um, the, the role and uh, the hours described in the appropriate regulation. Um, so it is there. Maybe this one, IPAC lead in many long-term care are also responsible for hiring of the new members designated to work in IPAC related activities. What are the thoughts with regards to this? So it's about involving the, the IPAC lead into uh, this, uh, hiring of some, uh, some members who are related um, to IPAC activities within the home. Okay, um, I don't have any uh, specific guidance. Different homes may involve uh, different people in decisions about recruitment and hiring. 
I do think if you have additional supports, whether they are hired positions or uh, champion supports or others within your home that are supporting your IPAC program, you do want people that are keenly interested in infection prevention and control who will be able to support um, willing to learn about infection prevention control content and very often strong communication skills to be working with staff and others if that will be part of their role. But I think it will depend a little bit on uh, what the role of those uh, support people are, if they will be involved in data or surveillance activities or teaching and supporting uh, frontline workers, um, you know, in different home areas that may help determine which characteristics you're looking for. But people that are passionate about it and really want to be involved in infection prevention control, uh, willingness to learn and strong communication skills, I think would serve uh, those positions quite well. Okay, thank you very much, um, uh, Sarah. And as we wrap up today's uh, webinar, and thank you very much, uh, Laurie and uh, uh, Sarah for presenting and answering questions. I would like also to thank everyone who joined to this webinar today. It, it is a great participation and we have a very uh, great interest. And um, you will uh, uh, receive from us a brief and anonymous survey for today's session. Uh, please uh, try to complete this to help us improve our, our programming and in future sessions. And lastly, to access the last uh, presentation and uh, a view confirmed upcoming sessions, please visit PHO website, um, as I said, and click on presentations. And uh, that's all for today. And thank you very much and have a, a wonderful today. Mm -hmm.